I'll start my message today with a reading from a book entitled Birders, Tales of a Tribe by Mark Cocker. Hitchcock was right, but it's not a sinister nightmare. It's heaven. Birds are everywhere. And while you may not notice it, I do. So do all birders. Like them, I identify, or at least attempt to identify, every single one I see without exception. I look at birds as I walk from the morning milk, when I go to the post box, as I drive the car. I recorded birds in the middle of the night, waking up to hear migrants flying outside the house. I have a pair of binoculars on my desk here now as I write, just in case. Their universal presence is one reason why birds have galvanized our interest like no other life form on earth. Birds are indeed everywhere. Birds inhabit all seven continents, including Antarctica, which means they occupy more of the earth than humans. Perhaps the fact that they are everywhere means that it is easy to take them for granted. I certainly did for many years. Of course, many people do pay attention to birds. About 50 million Americans plan at least one outing each year to observe wild birds, which means that birding is one of the largest outdoor hobbies in the US. This morning, I want to pay some attention to birds and show some appreciation for birders. The first birder I want to acknowledge is my mother. She taught me to notice birds, to listen to birds, and to appreciate them. She didn't have a life list or travel to exotic locations to see specific birds, but she was often on the lookout wherever she traveled. And I could sense her joy when she spied something new and interesting or an old favorite. So birds remind me of my mother and inspire me to be thankful for all the things my parents taught me. Today's reading came from a book by a British birder, Mark Cocker. I gave his book to my mother many years ago and then read it after she passed away. I remember that passage in which the author describes how he attempts to identify every single bird he sees without exception. I was intrigued by that statement because it indicates that birding is more than a hobby for him. It is a passion or the guiding principle in his life. And it made me reflect, have I ever turned a hobby into a guiding principle, either intentionally or unintentionally? Two years ago, when I chose this topic for the Mother's Day service at the Toledo Church, I felt compelled to find that book and reread it. Did I remember it correctly? Had I embellished it or romanticized it? The book was no longer on the home bookshelf, so I started searching for a copy. Mind you, I didn't remember the title of the book or even the author. I only recall that the book was written prior to 2006 and the author was British, which was not much help since there is a higher percentage of birders in the UK than anywhere else in the world. As I searched, I was dreading how to ask a librarian for help with such a limited information. I feared I would become a source of amusement throughout the staff only rooms of the Toledo Public Library System. So I was amazed and immensely relieved when I found the title and the author and was able to procure a copy. When I reread that passage, I felt as if I'd made a second sighting of an indigo bunting. The passage lived up to my expectations. However, I noticed something else this time. The author was not just writing about his passion. Whether he knew it or not, he was describing our faith tradition, a different definition of universalism. Birds are everywhere on earth. This is heaven. Birds are accessible to everyone. Hence, heaven is accessible to everyone. Heaven is wherever you find birds here on earth. My most holy experiences, my most holy bird experiences, have been at McGee Marsh, about 30 miles east of Toledo. I'd heard about something called the warbler migration, which happens every May, 
but I hadn't summoned the initiative to make a visit. So at the church auction a number of years ago, I bought a spot on a tour of the marsh led by the Olsons. They were not longtime members of our church as they had lived and worked in central Illinois, Illinois for many years and then chose to move to Toledo for retirement. Not a popular retirement location unless you are avid birders. My first trip to McGee Marsh with them was outstanding. I saw at least two, different, two dozen species of colorful small songbirds. I made connections with fellow UUs who I hadn't known very well before. And I learned some things about birding, such as how to move your binoculars without moving your head and thereby losing sight of the bird. I've returned almost every spring, sometimes going solo, sometimes coercing family members, but usually meeting up with a UU couple from Cleveland who are avid birders. The variety of warblers which stop on the south shore of Lake Erie is truly remarkable. If the technology gods are with us, I think you'll be seeing an image shortly to illustrate that. In any case, a handful of colors predominate, including shades of yellow and green, which are sometimes brighter than the emerging foliage, depending on the lighting. The hues of black, brown, white, and gray provide contrast to make the yellows and greens really stand out. You'll see a few orange markings, some reds, and one or two blues. This image was painted by an artist, a Florida artist, Kate Dollimore. She painted these birds in Florida, the same ones we see here in Toledo. And I would encourage you to check out her website um, if you get a chance. In any case, as much as I enjoy the warbler migration, some might describe the birding scene at McGee Marsh as hellish. This event is now marketed as the biggest week in American birding. During weekends in May, there will be hundreds of people on the boardwalk. Total attendance during April and May is estimated at 90,000 visitors from all 50 states and over 50 countries. The diversity of people is as remarkable as the diversity of birds. I have heard French, German, Spanish, Russian, and Japanese spoken there. And every year I see Amish families on the boardwalk, large extended Amish families in plain dress with well-thumbed guidebooks and modern binoculars. Returning to the warblers, their annual migration is an amazing feat for birds that weigh less than an ounce and measure less than six inches. Most of these birds spend the winter in warm southern climates such as Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean islands, and the northern part of South America, excuse me. Hence, these birds are classified as neotropical migrants. The term warbler was originally applied to certain old world birds because their songs included trills and quavers and other melodic embellishments characteristic of warbling. The same term was then applied to New World birds by the Europeans who visited and colonized America. However, our New World warblers are not closely related to the Old World warblers. They just sing. The warbler migration, of course, occurs over a wide swath of the eastern U.S. Northwest Ohio provides unmatched viewing opportunities because of Lake Erie. The birds mostly fly at night. So if they arrive at Lake Erie in the latter part of the night, somehow they decide to stop and feed and rest for the day before attempting to cross that vast expanse of water. In the fall migration, they stop on the northern shore and they're not as colorful. So the spring migration gets all the attention. According to Birdwatcher's Digest, 36 species of warblers migrate through Iowa in the spring. However, they can stop whenever and wherever they want in that great state. Since there are no natural barriers which force them to concentrate, the density of songbirds is much lower. Moreover, they are small and sometimes prefer the treetops so they can be difficult to see. 
the warbler might, <clears throat> excuse me, the warbler migration on the East Coast is featured in a film entitled Birders, The Central Park Effect. The filmmaker, Jeffrey Kimball, interviewed half a dozen regular birders in New York City's Central Park. You might think that an urban area as massive as New York City would have limited birds. In fact, the birds migrating up the, migrating up the East Coast need to stop and rest somewhere. So some of them funnel into the limited habitat in the heart of New York City. <clears throat> One of the interviewees in this film, Chris Cooper, humorously com comments that his friends just can't understand why he is completely unavailable for social engagements from mid-April to the end of May. You might recognize Chris Cooper from that disturbing incident in Central Park last May, as he was the African-American man who was birding and asked a white woman to comply with the park regulations and leash her dog. She called 911 and falsely claimed that he was threatening her and her dog. In any case, Chris compiled the list of the seven pleasures of birding. Number one, the beauty of the birds. No explanation required. Even relatively common backyard birds, such as cardinals, blue jays, goldfinches, robins and red-bellied woodpeckers display remarkable colors. Number two, the joy of being in a natural setting. Trees, fresh air, wildlife, and maybe even sunshine. If you don't see a bird, it is still time well spent. Number three, the joy of scientific discovery. Although it is unlikely that you or I will discover something new to the world of science, we may discover or learn something new to us. Many of these birds need to be seen more than once to observe their detailed markings. Number four, the joys of hunting without the bloodshed. The first birders were hunters who thought the only way to identify what a bird was in the hand, which is understandable prior to the era of cameras and binoculars. Indeed, Audubon's favorite famous book, Birds of America, was painted from stuffed dead specimens. The famous naturalist of the 19th century, whom I admire, collected carcasses. Charles Darwin collected thousands of birds during the five-year voyage on the Beagle, and he was reputed to be an excellent marksman for his ability to bring down these small creatures. Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discoverer of natural selection, earned his living and financed his field trips to South America and Southeast Asia by collecting bird carcasses and sending them back to collectors. So for modern birders, pleasure number four is probably better described as the joy of stalking rather than the joy of hunting. Number five, the joy of puzzle solving. These birds don't usually pose in the open for your viewing pleasure. You often get only a glimpse of one side and then they flit off to a different branch where you get a different perspective. So you have to fit the observations together. Number six, the joy of collecting or keeping a list. I was skeptical of this item because it seemed competitive to me but I have found it a useful memory aid. And finally, number seven, my favorite, the unicorn effect. You might become familiar with a species by studying the field guide, but haven't had the opportunity to see the, one of those birds in real life. So those birds take on mythological status, like a unicorn. When you do finally spot that elusive bird, it feels magical. I am waiting to see the painted bunting. So these are the seven pleasures of birding experienced by humans. But what about the warblers? I doubt they get any pleasure from us, from us stalkers or puzzlers or collectors. Do they get any pleasure from singing? Do they get any pleasure from listening to each other? Based on my limited knowledge of animal behavior, I assume that bird singing is simply instinctual. 
Charles Hartshorn had a different view. Hartshorn was an American philosopher who specialized in the philosophy of religion and metaphysics. He attended several UU churches during his lifetime, though he didn't describe himself as a UU, and he preached at UU congregations. Hartshorn has been described as the first philosopher since Aristotle to be an expert in both metaphysics and ornithology. Towards the end of his career, he wrote a book entitled Born to Sing, an interpretation and world survey of birdsong. He described how birds sing outside of the mating season and that some birds sing even when their territory does not seem to be threatened. Based on these observations, he concluded that birds just like to sing and suggested that they sing to communicate emotions such as joy. The title of this message, of course, comes from the Emily Dickinson poem, which I used for the meditation reading. In that poem, she compares the concept of hope to a feathered bird that is permanently perched in the soul of every human. There it sings, never stopping in its quest to inspire. It say, sings, especially when times get tough. But the song has no words, no diction for anyone to understand. The speaker in the poem has heard the bird during the hardest, coldest times when emotions are churning. Even when things are extreme, hope is still there and never asks for anything. I want to turn Dickinson's metaphor around a little bit. At times, we can despair that nature is falling apart. And then unexpectedly, a goldfinch or a tufted titmouse or a Baltimore Oriole appears, and everything feels a little better. In those moments, these feathered creatures bring hope and spiritual renewal. I fear that we are at risk of losing nature because we are losing our connections to nature. So I urge you to stay connected to the natural world and to keep hope alive. Stay connected by listening for birds. Stay connected by observing birds. If you haven't seen the wonders of the spring warbler migration, take a trip east in May. Visit First Unitarian of Toledo and then make a pilgrimage to McGee Marsh. Stay connected by visiting a city park or a nearby state park. You might not see many warblers, but Iowa hosts many other avian immigrants. The waterways, lakes, and res reservoirs are good places to spot migrating shorebirds and waterfowl. Finally, stay connected by paying attention to every bird every day as they bring us hope. Blessed be and amen.